the shortest way possible, you know, who you are, what you stand for, and how you're going to help the people. And that last part is key. How are you going to help the people who you are trying to serve? Exactly. And I think the other piece of it is um, an authenticity to yourself. Absolutely. Because if you have a message that doesn't feel authentic to you, it's not going to be long-term sustainable, but it also needs to really be resonant with your people. And the only way to do that is to learn who they are and not to sort of assume, um, but to go through whatever process of, of audience research you're going to go through to really get to know them and to understand them. And then that's when we can do things like leverage pain points or frustrations as a way of saying, Hey, I hear you. It's almost a tool. Of, it's a tool of compassion. It isn't almost, it is as opposed to a scare tactic. That's good. I like that. A tool of compassion. Yeah. You see, and therein comes the elegance in the wordsmithing compared to the way that, that people just think and write. That, that whole use of English thing, I think, mm-hmm. is where a lot of those benefits really come out because you really get some very different, different flavours and aspects with the words and how they're used in that way. So um, I'd just like to uh, check in, really, because I think it makes perfect sense here. Um, there's a quote that you shared with me, which uh, I also see is, um, is top left on, uh, on Jesse's Instagram feed at the moment as well, or it certainly was a little while ago today. Um, and, and the quote is this, trust thyself, every heart vibrates to that iron string. So Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, um, tell me about that and why it resonates with you both and how that also very much taps in to this whole messaging piece. And I think it probably boils down into that authenticity and personality within people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, you know, harkens back to the English nerds that Marie and I truly are. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really, it, when one of the things that we like to talk about a lot with messaging in general is that your job is to build a bridge between yourself and your audience. And there's a lot of information out there about the market research side of things, how to really know your audience so that you can appeal to their needs and guide them where they need to go. And there's also a huge number of people who come to us saying, but I don't know how to convey my values, my voice, my principles in a way that yes, connects to them, but also is true to me. And that's where that bridge comes in. And that's where trusting yourself comes in. Trusting that if you do a little work and if you follow your intuition and if you follow the strategies, you can really do things like create a branded word bank that is true to your business. You can do things like have a value system that is represented in your messaging in a way that's not sort of, you know, punching people in the face with it. It's not so overt that you're forcing it on people, but it's just you standing in your truth. And it really does come down to trusting that doing that rather than looking for the next hot strategy to come down your Facebook feed is going to be the solution. Just trusting that you have what it takes and there are a few simple things you can do to put your message out there in a really compelling way. Mm -hmm. And I think the other piece of that quote that's so appealing to us is trusting yourself. I think as we have discovered is step one for stepping into your leadership. And we really believe that the stronger your message is in terms of, yes, you know, the strategies, all of that, but also that authentic piece, um, that is the key to developing strong leadership as well. And we can dig into that a little bit more later, but the Emerson quote definitely touches on both of those for us. So I'm intrigued to know then, through, through your history of working together over the last sort of seven or eight years, how do you feel that your, that your own messaging has evolved in that time that you've been working together? Um, how have things changed for you in that period of time? Uh, leaps and bounds, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of that is because the, who we serve has changed over time, obviously, you know, going from people who need help with a resume or even just doing some um, essentially freelance work really in uh, both the sort of curriculum side of things where Jesse had experience and also the nonprofit grant support where I had experience. You know, initially we just were sort of writers who said yes to things. And there was so much lack of clarity in that message that it really hurt us. And there came a point at which the, um, all of the word of mouth leads dried up 
And also we both moved away from Houston. And so we were away from our professional networks, trying to establish that again. And um, that wasn't, it wasn't working for us the way it had before. And so that's when we had to really take a moment and we actually literally got together um, and had a little tete-a-tete and we're like, okay, what are we going to do with this business? Are we going in different directions. We actually have complementary skill sets, but they also could diverge, right? And, um, or are we going to be coming together? And if so, what does that look like? And it was, um, it was a really pivotal moment for our business, but that's really the start. We didn't actually rebrand um, to North Star Messaging and Strategy for another maybe year or so. But at that point, that's when we made the decision that we were going to be supporting entrepreneurs. And as we became more assured in what we were doing and gained additional confidence, learned about online marketing, um, and really found our footing again. That's when we started um, speaking more confidently about leadership development as a piece of that. That's when we started talking about thought leaders in entrepreneurial roles, how copy had to fit into all of this and messaging as a whole. Um, and so really over time, it's been an evolution. It's always an evolution, I think, for everybody. But um, you know, we, I felt like we made the right decisions for where we were at the time and it's all leading us down this path. So I don't think of it as a, we made the wrong choices or anything like that at the time. You know, it's just, it's part of the journey. I think that's, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think I'm definitely a believer in you can only play with what's in front of you at a point in time. You see mm-hmm. what you see. Um, it's a question of how well can you adapt to those circumstances and can you work out if it's the right thing, the wrong thing, what are you going to change? What are you going to migrate to? Um, is is half the deal as a business owner and entrepreneur, really. That That is the game at the end of the day. Can you keep up with other people? Can you get ahead of yourself? Can you, you know, how lucky can you get picking the right path first time round? Not many people manage to do that. You know, there's an awful lot of um, guidance and feeling. And yes, this is my passion. But I know from my own journey, and certainly going back through that challenge of yours, um, there were things that I realized in actually physically writing in the boxes on the workbook, how things had evolved for myself and use of language and those sorts of things. And I think we so often lose sight of the fact that we are on this journey and things do evolve. And sometimes we don't actually take the time to check in with ourselves and see what has changed and what that now means and how things now translate coming out the other side so although that was a challenge that that you obviously put out which I went through how do you do is that how you go through your own framework and do you revisit that periodically as as a formal experience in your business together yeah ever since that first meeting where we met up in person and made that decision of are we going to stay together as a business and if we are what is it going to look like or are we going to split up and part ways we have every 6 months or so come together usually in person sometimes not but set aside a block of time to go through that process of looking at our business plan, looking at what's sustainable in our business, looking at our vision for the future to see if it's changed and looking at sort of what kind of things have come up over the last six months that feel really heavy or feel really exciting. And how can we weave those exciting things into our business in a way that helps with the sustainability and the profitability without diluting our message? Yeah, I think that that's, um, it's one of those things because one of the sort of, if you like, the supplementary questions that, that I have around that is, is where do you, where do you take your guidance from around that? Is it a, um, a sort of thing that you, um, you look at and say, okay, do we feel the same about the things we've been doing? Do we like them? Do we still like them? Do we see that they've shifted? It, it, does inspiration come from working with certain clients in those passages of time where you suddenly think that was really neat we really got on to something there I think we need to do more of that thing I presume that your inspiration for the for the change if you think it's warranted can come almost from anywhere really yeah absolutely yeah for sure interesting because it really is um a lot of it is intuitive like that like you were um just giving examples of. And then some of it, of course, is data driven. You look at it and you say, okay, we tried this thing, but the numbers don't reflect that it's going to work. So maybe we try a different version of that thing or we tweak it and things like that. So I think that's one of the things that we've gotten really good at, especially in the last three years or so, 
is yes, asking ourselves that question, but then also looking at the numbers and the data and being like, okay, but does our intuition, is it supported in any sort of concrete way so that we're not just throwing darts at a dartboard blindly? <laughs> it's just not too whimsical on that basis. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think I'd like to go off and do this. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that, that, but then again, I guess, is where you very much get that whole, you know, the logic and the feeling balance that come into it, that you will both actually appreciate all of these things in a slightly different way, albeit you may be working same clients, same process, that you will see and feel those things slightly differently, which is, um, so I guess we are, we're fast proving that two brains are better than one then really, aren't we, along the way. But that again, I guess that only works because of the other complementary things that you have in the background. Right, I mean, I think it, it comes with a healthy dose of learning, you know, when things work between us, when they, you know, things don't work for the both of us that might work for just one of us, um, keeping that communication line open, um, knowing that there's nothing too sensitive to sort of keep out of it, that it's better to have the open discussion. And since we do have that principle of friends first, we never go into any kind of disagreement thinking, okay, this is it. The business is ending and our friendship is over yeah. if we can't come to an agreement on this. I mean, we top priority for both of us is preserving the friendship and the business. And so it happens, you know, if that's the goal, then it, it comes to fruition. So um, yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I think sometimes, you know, people aren't um, setting up their partnerships in a way that's meant for longevity and that's totally fine. I mean, not all two humans on planet earth could be brought together and have an effective partnership over time. It's, it doesn't need to happen that way, but um, it's totally possible um, when you when you both are sort of in the same space, you have the same priorities, you have the same work ethic, and you have a vision that can be aligned. Yeah, very much so. So I'd like to, like to just move on a little bit now, and let's get a, dive a little bit deeper into this messaging and, and how it affects us all. So one of the things that, that cropped up when we were talking beforehand is this idea that entrepreneurs actually neglect their message, which almost seems counterintuitive. Is this because we, we all tend to feel that we know what we think we're saying, um, but in actual fact, we don't. And it's not clear. Clarity is a word that you've both used um, already while we've been talking. And is it because it's just not clear enough and we can't see it as individuals um, sort of from the inside almost? We just don't have that perception. I think that's definitely a big part of it. I think there's also a big part of entrepreneurship, especially early on when you're just starting your business, where you're so excited about starting your business that taking time to think about your message isn't really top of mind beyond maybe, okay, I need to have something catchy on the top of my website and my website needs to make sense and be coherent. But messaging is deeper than the words you use. It's bigger than the words you use. Your messaging is conveyed through every piece of your brand, through your words, through your colors, through your graphics and your photos, all of those things. Just the way you have a casual conversation or treat your clients is a part of your messaging. So it, it, it's so integral in everything that people forget it's there. And they forget that everything they do contributes to the overall message that they're sending the world about their business. And I think that's how it gets forgotten until you're maybe three, four, five years in, and you realize that there's a disconnect between what you believe your business is and what the world is seeing. It's, um, it, it is, I do find this interesting, actually, because I, I heard somebody say the other day, um, we tend to forget that the thing that we take for granted is actually the superpower that everybody else sees. And it was just this idea that you think, okay, so to paraphrase and please don't shoot me down for this, but as writers, you don't necessarily see that, you know, that you have something, you know, you're good at what you do, but you don't necessarily, the value doesn't register in quite the same way as it probably does for your clients who think oh, I could never have written that. I would never have thought about it like this. And yet it's the same for all of us just across different skill sets. And we so easily forget that the thing that we do do does have value to these other people. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we actually have a, a framework that we've developed of thought leadership. And one of the key pieces of that is innovation. And we find so often people don't recognize their own innovation. And so the questions that we can ask ourselves are, 
when has a client told me, you know, wow, I've never thought of it like that, or you really opened my eyes to this, or um, man, that was a breakthrough, or this really keeps sticking with me. Whenever you hear stuff like that, 